that's not enough. That's not enough for me. I know my worth. I know the value that I provide. And there's that little girl inside of me that's like, don't give up, Julie. Like, you've got this. You can be anything you want. Just put in the work. I'm not going anywhere. You're listening to episode 13 of Success Unscripted. My guest today, Julie Fox, is an accomplished customer success leader who has won countless awards and is a top voice in the larger customer success community. When we recorded this episode, she had just been laid off for the second time. The first time happened right after she gave birth to her second child. So a lot of the themes in today's episode center around perseverance, growing through change, and how to create an even better life for yourself when shitty things happen. I'm thrilled to share that since recording this episode, Julie has accepted an offer and she has a ton of insight for folks who are trying to navigate this challenging job market. So we're gonna record a follow-up with some of her best tips. Keep an eye out for that. As always, thanks for being here. I'm your host, Sarah Roberts, and you're listening to Success Unscripted. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for us to finally connect. I know. I know. It's, um, and thank you for, for your flexibility last week during the snowstorm. There was just, <laughs> oh, um, having kids always throws a wrench in things, you know? Um, sure so, but yeah, I'm super excited about this and a um, bunch of different topics that I have in mind for us to, to chat about. But I want to start with so many people going through these layoffs I know that that can have such an impact on on every aspect of your life when it's like this thing that you've worked so hard for and has become part of your identity is just ripped away from you. And you were on mat leave. Yes. And you got laid off. So what was yeah. that like for you? It was a very raw experience. I think, you know, you pour your heart and soul into a company. A lot of my confidence, a lot of kind of who I am as a person stems from feeling really, really good about the work that I do. Yeah. And so I feel like having that taken away from me, it was, it was really jarring. And for me, it actually turned into kind of a cool story. The easy thing for me to do would have been to continue on in the, in the path in the community and network that, that I built. I was in commercial real estate before getting into tech. And I hated the way that people... When I told them kind of what had happened, I hated the, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, you poor thing, or oh my gosh, you need to take legal action. Or like, it's like, whatever the reactions that I would get, they were always really negative. Yeah. And I mean, I had just had a baby. I was, I was truly in the thick of it. And not to mention, I was physically still recovering. Like my body was still healing in this moment as, as I'm kind of trying to navigate, what am I going to do with my life? But I think it allowed me to really take kind of that pause and think, hey, is this enough? Is this what I want for my life? Is this something that I'm truly passionate and excited about? And I wasn't. I felt confident in it because I was good at it, but there wasn't that that fire within me that that I felt the way that I do about customer success. And so it was, I look back on that moment and it's like something that could have been a really negative thing, truly turned into one of the best things that could have ever happened to me. Was there a specific moment that you recall where you were able to shift your mindset or did that kind of happen gradually over time? The question you're asking, you're more so of saying like the mindset of me being like, hey, this was a negative thing versus a positive. Is that yeah, what like when you're, I mean, you've just given birth, probably not getting any sleep, <laughs> physically exhausted, hormones are raging, you get laid off. And everybody around you is like, well, God damn it. They like, how is that legal for, you know, know, there's just all this kind of stuff. Like there's no way that in, in that moment, immediately you were like, I'm going to make this a happy story. Like there had to have been a turning point, right? Like, Yeah. yeah. So I remember literally calling my husband from the Starbucks parking lot because it happened at a Starbucks and it was all of a sudden I just like the wave of emotions hits me and I am full on like hysterical. I am bawling and I call my husband because, you know, he'll be able to hear what I'm saying. And he actually was the one who kind of paused me and he was like, can I ask you a question? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, are you upset because you really 
loved your job and cared about it? Or are you upset because your feelings are hurt? Aww. And I was like, I was upset because my feelings were hurt. Like I was, I was very, I was upset about that. And I was upset about like the unknown of like, oh my gosh, was the impact going to be on my family and, and all that. But it's like just that one question literally made me like stop and think about it and be like, you know what? I'm not crazy passionate about this job that I'm doing. And I was like, you know what? I can allow something good to come out of this. I don't have to take the easy answer, the easy way out. I can use this time and find something that that brings me joy. Tell me the story about that job that you finally ended up getting after like six months of people telling you well you're not tech experience. yeah oh my gosh it was so it was so hard because apparently you have to have tech experience to get into tech doesn't necessarily make sense but at the same time like there's something about being able to like plug somebody in that's done the role before but for me personally in that moment as i kept getting rejection after rejection after rejection it was really frustrating because like I said, I, I had been a leader and here I am literally begging people just to take a chance on me that I, I'll right. prove myself. I'll show you what I can do. And the company that I ended up joining, they actually rejected me multiple times before I finally got them to say yes to me. But when I first sent in the application, within days got the dreaded automated rejection email. And so I was really, truly bummed because this was not just a company that I was like blindly applying to. So I got that rejection and I immediately went to LinkedIn and I messaged their CEO and I said, hi, my name's Julie. I'm trying to apply to this job and I can't send in a cover letter. Literally just ignored the fact that I had already applied and gotten the rejection. But I was like, hey, who should I send a cover letter to? <laughs> so he sends me somebody's name and I... Like I reach out to them. And so that, that started the whole experience where at least they gave me the time of day. But after many conversations, they, the answer kept still being no. They were like, I really need somebody with a specific type of background that you don't have. I get it. I understand. I was empathetic to that. But at the same time, I let them know, like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to keep coming back. Like <laughs> I, and like, I, I let them know how badly I wanted to work for them and why asked for feedback, the whole gamut. And ultimately I even like, I mean, I tried to get creative of being like, Hey, I know I need to get tech experience. Like, cause at that point they were like, it doesn't even need to be customer success experience. You just need to have experience in tech. So I was like, I could go to another company and go get experience. Or what if I get experience at your company in another department or something, and then move my, like find my way over to customer success. So I interviewed with different teams, like I had talked to so many people and this whole process lasted months. And then finally, I let them know that I, I had gotten a job offer that I was accepting. And I let them know like, hey, I just want to let you know, you're going to see on LinkedIn that I have, that I've accepted this job. I am doing this for the sole purpose of getting tech experience so I can go back to you. So again, like I just was like, I'm not going anywhere. Like I'm doing this so I can come back to you. Um, but I wanted them to know that because I didn't want them to see that I was like, that I had, that I was employed and had a job and then be like, oh, good, Julie's off our back. She's like, she's happy now. Like, no, I'm, I'm still here. Um, so finally, they, um, they took a chance on me. I started out as a CSM and it was the coolest experience because with them, like I even joke with people sometimes that like this one experience was like I got my MBA in customer success because it was this earlier stage, growth stage company, but um, very scrappy, very small team. And I was able to help influence and build out the playbooks, the templates, kind of everything from scratch. And I mean, it, it was such a cool experience because when I started, it's like CS literally meant everything. Like we were support, we were onboarding, like we, we were touching it, we were doing it all. And slowly but surely as the company grew and the team grew, we segmented, we specialized, we went through all of that and went through acquisitions and stuff like that. But it allowed me the opportunity to not only have a really, really big impact, but also I was able to grow with them quickly. I, I quickly moved into a team lead role and then ultimately into managing multiple teams there. I mean, that's, that's always one of the biggest advantages of going to an earlier stage startup is that Assuming they do well, you can 
keep getting promoted and your career is going to accelerate way faster than it would elsewhere. Yeah. But there's not a lot of support. So how was that being so new in that role in that type of company? Did you have like any mentors or? It was a little bit like the wild, wild west for a little bit. Like there was a period where it was like, hey, try whatever you want do like within reason, of course. But it's like, as I built trust with them, that's more so what allowed me to start trying things differently. And then what I did with that was I started sharing out loud. As a CSM, I started leading from within in the sense of not only helping kind of onboard and mentor and coach other people, but also just sharing my own experiences and the good and the bad. And I think that's what really helped kind of build a culture around feedback and collaboration. And it really kind of brought the team together. By no means did I do this. We're all building, we're all pushing each other and making each other better. And I think it was like through that, that then we were able to create something that was really pretty phenomenal. Like we're actually like, we're doing a pretty good job as like, as the small scrappy team, like we're doing a lot of really big, important things. But yeah, you mentioned mentors, but most companies that I go to, there's, I always will ask for mentorship of somebody within my department, as well as somebody with like outside of my department. For example, our director of sales was my mentor at that company. She was fierce, incredible, take no shit. Like before I even knew her that well, I was like, I want to spend more time with you. I want to learn from you. And so I just basically told her what I thought of her and was like, is, would you consider taking time to mentor me? And she was like, hey, put time for 90 minutes on my calendar. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know if I've had 90 minutes with like my own boss in that, like in a while. Like, I mean, it was just such a gift. She is still somebody that I stay in touch with and honestly has been instrumental now that I'm job searching again. I don't think anybody teaches that. Like, where does this come from? For the most part, I think it's like I had been in these male dominated industries yeah. where I felt like I had to work harder. I felt like I had to prove myself. And some of that started in the work world. Some of that started even like as a kid of just being like, I'm the youngest of three girls. So I always felt that sense of like competition of like, I'm the youngest, look at me, please, like, please give me attention, good or bad. And so it's like, as I got older, that shifted to being like, I want to prove myself that I belong here. I had a ton of imposter syndrome. Like I'm by no means was it this easy shift where I was like, I know exactly what I'm doing day one. Like I had no idea what I was doing. And so I had to lean on others. I had to ask questions. I had to, I had to be more, more like vulnerable with my experience because I feel like my whole career leading up to this, I never would have said, I don't know. But I realized that the way that I was doing things prior, it wasn't going to work anymore. Um, I couldn't just Google how to do customer success. There's no right way to do something or wrong way necessarily. Like there's 10 things that you could do and it's choosing what's best for the customer. And so I really had to learn by doing and realizing like, I don't have to learn everything the hard way. I can learn from other people. And I, I truly believe that that makes me a better leader because you're not just getting me. You're not just getting who I am today. You're getting kind of who I continue to evolve and become. The perseverance that you had during those six months of, of knocking down people's doors and saying, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. There's this almost like unshakable confidence how do you keep when the door keeps getting slammed in your face? How do you keep going? I, I love that question because it's not, there's not one answer, but a lot of when it comes to confidence and grit and, and kind of that relentless energy that a lot of that has to come from within. And some of that, like some of that is like my personality and like who I am, but a lot of that has come over time. And it's partially it's been learned through having negative experiences. I think after you go through a couple things where you feel like, you know, you've, you've fallen on your face. And I feel like I had a lot of those experiences, especially through like college and early in my career where I struggled with anxiety and depression and figuring out where do I fit in and who am I and, and all of that. And I feel like a lot of those struggles, it just kept building upon kind of that, those layers of that confidence and assurance of like, I know my worth, I know who I am, but I also know that like, I'm going to be okay. Like I was just laid off um, a couple of weeks ago, actually from, from my previous company. And 
God, it's terrifying. This job market is insane. I mean, there are, I will submit an application and then it's like, you'll go on the next day and it's like over a thousand applications and it's like, oh my yeah. God, like, ah. and so I'm definitely like, I'm getting smarter. I'm handling it a lot differently than how I've handled other job searches, but it is truly terrifying. But at no point am I letting it like get me down because the reality is like, first of all, it's not a reflection of me. Like I know my worth, I know the value that I provide. And it really helps that I feel like I have had a lot of positive feedback, the people that I have invested in over time and kind of helped shape in their careers. I feel like those are the people that right now are wrapping their arms around me and being like, you're going to be okay. You're going to be great. You're going to be better than okay. And so that helps quite a bit. But again, I think it's just those layers of experiences and knowing that like every time I come out stronger, every time it ends up being the best thing that could have ever happened to me. And in the moment, I know it sucks. Like I'm going to let myself feel that. I'm going to let myself live in the suck for a period of time. But at the same time, I still know in my heart, I I know full heartedly that I'm going to be okay. And that this is all just kind of, it's a part of my story. And I'll be able to look back on it and be like, thank God this happened because it led me somewhere better. Yeah. I mean, it's so hard to, to see in the moment. And and like you said, with practice and it happening over and over again, it's a little bit easier to have that confidence, I think. But I mean, I've, I've been going through a similar experience. Um, I mean, my, my primary business is a recruiter. Like I work with series A startups that have just gotten like, you know, 20 to $30 million in series A funding. And I mean, I had a couple searches last year, but like, not what it should be or yeah, it, it's a weird, weird. Yeah. Yeah. So, so struggling with my self-confidence and where is this going to go? And, um, but also trying to kind of like you, I mean, I wouldn't have started this podcast had work been steady because I, I just wouldn't have had the time for it. And yeah, so I just feel like you learn so much in, in the, in those bad times, those down times, that's where you start to get more creative. That's where you start to get more gritty and just look at things from different perspectives because it's like when it's easy, you just keep doing what you're doing because it's working. Well, exactly. I mean, you probably would have never left, maybe not never, but at that point you wouldn't have left real estate. No, I, I never. And I wouldn't have left that job. Like, right. I'm a loyal person. I, it's not like I was job searching or trying to find something. I think that's what like shook me so much because I felt so unprepared, but I wasn't fulfilled. But yet I was staying out of like the principle of like, I have a job, I'm doing a good job at my job and I'm getting paid well. So I'm going to keep on doing my job. And it's like, that's not enough. That's not enough for me. And I think that's something in these last couple of years that customer success has given me is like, it lights my soul on fire. Like, I love what I do. I love (laughs) working with customers. And sorry, I'm cheesy. I can't help myself. No, I love it. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but like, I genuinely like, I love what I do. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, I think with that passion, that's where like, I have found kind of to your earlier advice of finding projects and things like that. Like when there have been moments that I have felt like not as excited about the work that I was doing, it's like, I latch on to projects. I find something that I love. Right. And like, when I get excited about something, like I can run through brick walls. And so it's like, that's where like, i I know myself that it's like, if I'm starting to get lazy, if I'm starting to get bored, like I've got to find something that makes me passionate or like gets me excited because otherwise, like I'll just kind of like, I'll go into that easy mode and like, that's not who I am. And so it's like, that's where I I have to find something that fulfills me or something that excites me. So what have you learned about yourself this time around? Um, You know what? There's not many opportunities in life where you get to publicly go out to the market and say, I'm looking. And in this world right now, because the job market is so crazy, there's so much less of a stigma of people that are like, oh, you've been laid off. Like, I don't have the, I don't have the reactions that I had that first time where people thought that I was a victim or, oh, you poor thing. People instead go straight into action mode. They're like, how can I help you? What can I do? Let's get on a Zoom call. And I feel like there's no awkwardness. There's no awkwardness. And so I I really appreciate that. I appreciate that it's like straight into action mode. I feel like a lot of the advice that I got from people at the beginning was like, take a week off, take some time to relax. And I was like, you clearly don't know me. I'm not going to do that. (laughs) (laughs) 
I mean, I would have given you that advice, but sure. Okay. Well, the thing is, I just like, I imagine myself if I would have like gone on a vacation or even like gone to go get a massage in those first like days after being let go. I feel like that would have been terrible for my mental health because I would have been all in my head and thinking through every little thing. Instead, what I did was I went straight into action mode. I started messaging people. I started, I I had kind of a day or so of filling out a bunch of applications, realized that that was maybe not the smartest way for me to go about this. Uh, Because with that also comes a lot of rejection and that will mess with you mentally. Yeah. And so instead I started reaching out to a lot of people and I looked at kind of creating that pedestal list of companies of what are companies I want to work for? What are products that I really enjoy that I've either been a customer for, or I'd like to be a customer or something that like just excites me. And who are the leaders in in the community that I really, really enjoy and want to want to work with. And so it was a decent sized list. And I just started reaching out to people. And instead of just focusing on companies that had open positions, I started reaching out to people and saying, Hey, do you have any plans to grow or expand your CS or CX leadership uh, team within the next couple months? Through that, I found that tons of opportunities are not posted. And so that has helped. But I feel like at the point that I started feeling the feelings of whatever was going through my head, I at least had enough momentum that I felt a lot more in control. I felt a lot better about it because it was like, okay, I can feel this. I can feel sad. I can feel disappointed. I I am. I I was genuinely disappointed. But at the same time, I already had enough momentum and conversations that had happened and things that I was pretty excited about that it kind of made me be like, I'm going to be okay. And so I feel like that that helped me at least to be like, okay, I'm going to go heavy into action mode and then I'll take some time to rest. Once once I find the right fit, I'll take a week off and, and give myself a moment. <laughs> a <week laughs> once <off>. I, <already. laughs> I don't know. Who knows? We'll see. We'll see what I'm feeling. <laughs> okay, a couple hours. I'm just kidding. I love what you've done recently too, where instead of focusing so much on where's my next opportunity and how can I get out of this position, you're giving back and you're lifting up other people and specifically the women in the CS community. What is it? A weekly spotlight? Yeah. Yeah. I've started doing a weekly spotlight on different, on like the women that have shaped me. So, um, so far, it has been Christy Faltroso, Miranda, and this week um, will be Nisha Baxi. I'm sure that will be out before before this podcast is out. But like you said, like I, I've spent more time and focus on helping others. And then through that, I feel like I've built this community that now that I am saying, hey, I need help. I'm out of work. I'm looking for my next move. Like I feel like I have this army of people that are helping me. And that is something that I, I will never stop investing in this CS community because it is like just the coolest experience to be on the other side of this and realize how meaningful that is. But also like back to that mental health perspective, like there are days where I feel sad. There are days where like a meeting gets shifted or an interview gets moved from one day to another and looking around like, what am I supposed to do with my time now? Because I'm used to having such a busy schedule. And so trying to figure out how to fill that space with something that's productive. And so for me, that's giving back to the community and figuring out what I can do to help other people. That's how I can show up. Do you have any hobbies or things that, that you like to throw yourself into? I always think it's funny when you ask parents what their hobbies are, because I'm like, my hobbies are my children. (laughs) Um, Truly. I feel like I, any, any time that I am not working, I am like, pouring myself into my kids or, or working out. And that's exhausting because it's like, I pour my heart and soul into my work. And then my kids come home and I give everything to them. And it's like, I, I give all of myself. And then you have those moments at the end of the day where I'm just like, my husband tries to ask me like, Hey, how was your day today? And I'm like, I'm out of words. I'm sorry. I don't have any, like, I'm like, I'm done talking. Well, I guess I just asked because maybe Maybe this is an opportunity for you to sit with those quiet moments a little more. Yeah. You know. Sarah, I do have a hobby. I I don't know how (laughs) I forgot my hobby. (laughs) 
You tell me what your hobby. <laughs> um, I paint. Oh, there we go. Yeah, perfect. I am a painter and I I love that you like you are the one you just like reminded me because I have not picked up a paintbrush in these last like ha- after all this has happened. Like why am I not doing that? Why am I not spending time to do this? I'm glad you said that because I because I can relate to it. <laughs> Because like for my husband, it's hockey and I can't relate to that, but just getting, it just like quiets the minds. We built this house a couple of years ago. And when I went to buy art for it, that was like what brought back up my like artistic side. I went to buy art and I was like, I can't spend $4,000 on like something that's not even big. Oh, all, of the, all of the art. So I painted all everything in our house. Going. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Stop it. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, I do all the painting. And it just, it gives me something to do, you know, but it like, it's the process too. So Julie, yeah. get out your paintbrushes. Okay, I am. I am sold. This is, I'm like, this was a very productive conversation because I, you reminded me that I do have a hobby and I need to get back to it. <laughs> well, and it's hard, no, it's hard to remember. And it's hard to make space for that. Yeah. You know, and it's been, it's been a while since I have too, but. Um, Can we just have like a Zoom paint dates where like. Oh my God. Just, like, sit in silence and paint or we could talk i mean that would be we could do we could do like um one of those like you know paint nights but virtually yes i'm all in do it oh my gosh okay (laughs) we're gonna do that um paint night have you tried any of like the pouring art style art no, but I've, I've been, I've seen it. I've seen well, videos. My sister has recently started doing that and she does it with her kids. So I feel like if her kids can do it, like I can probably, I haven't tried it yet, but the stuff that she does, it's like, it turns out super, super cool. So we, maybe we could try that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll look that up too. I feel like it's that, like, it's the escape from reality of like, it's, I'm not in my head. I'm just, I'm in the moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, you'll have to take some photos of, of some of your work and send it to me. That scared me a little bit. Yeah. I'm glad I reminded you of painting because I think you need to get back at it. I think for everybody, you have to figure out what works for you. Like say for most people, like they need to rest. They need to have that time to like feel everything and rest before they jump into a job search. For me, because I'm looking at a list of a million things that I need to do, like the only way out of it is through it for me. Like I've got to yeah. just get started. And once I start checking things off, like that's what makes me feel better. And so you've said similar things about being a leader and especially as a female. And one of my past guests, Andrea, made the point that like a lot of people in leadership positions have historically been privileged white men. And so therefore, a lot of the qualities that we associate with leadership are qualities that come from that group of people. And not that they're all bad, necessarily, but they but they don't work for everybody. It doesn't feel authentic. Yeah. And it's like, right. I think that's, it's like this whole idea that we, that as soon as you become a leader or a manager, that you have to fit into this mold and be this person that's not you. Like that's, it's it's just not true. And I think that's where like, I just realized this in this moment until I made my way over to tech. So just in the last couple of years prior to that, I had never had a female manager Mm. and you see these maybe aggressive tendencies or things where it's like, you know, if they feel strongly about something, they get really loud and passionate and like, that's not necessarily who I am. Like when I'm passionate, I'm excited and I'm like, what, but it's, I, I'm not, I'm not loud and yelling at, at people. Or I'm, not, I'm not slamming my hands down and, and whatnot, but I've figured out that I don't have to be somebody else. I can be exactly who I am and that the qualities that, that have built me and got me to where I am of like being empathetic, being being kind, being motivating. It's like, I can get so much more out of people by focusing on the good and doing more of like do more style of coaching. Not to say that I don't give constructive feedback, but I focus also a lot of time on telling people what they're doing well and what, what I'd like to see more of. Mm -hmm. But the difference with, I think when I, when I work with people, I really get to know them on a human level. 
it's truly more of like a partnership of like, hey, we're going to do some hard things together. We're going to push each other. I'm going to be there for you every step of the way. And we're going to do this together. To me, being a leader is one of like the most fulfilling things in the world because it's like you're you're helping shape people. You become part of their story. Like, you know, like I want people to look back on their experience with me and be like, wow, this person changed my life for the better. Like, how cool is that to be able to have that impact on somebody? Yeah. Yeah. One of the the challenges of being laid off, I think, is that it can feel isolating and lonely. If I wasn't as busy as I've been, or if I didn't have so many people reaching out, I feel like those could have been really dark moments that could have been very sad. At the moment that I like send my kids off to school and I'm in an empty house, I think that would have felt very lonely. But through this process, I really haven't had many of those moments where I feel lonely. And I think that's because of this virtual network and people that are, are reaching out and, and those friendships that I've formed. I mean, I think it can be kind of daunting, especially to start posting on LinkedIn and reaching out. And um, obviously, once you build some momentum, then it, it gets a little bit less scary. But, um, you know, there can be that like, oh, is anyone going to respond to this or sometimes they don't like sometimes you post something I had something um actually I posted something today that technically I posted yesterday waited 15 minutes not a single person had like liked it or commented and I took it down I like copied and pasted and took it down I was like we'll try this tomorrow because I was like (laughs) it's not getting anywhere and I think that's like that's where if you get wrapped up in like the likes and the comments and yeah. all of that. I think it's, it can, it can spiral in a really negative way. And I think you have to keep focused on like, why am I doing this? For me, I'm doing this to help people. I don't need likes to help people. Like if I have five likes on a post instead of 500, like that doesn't mean that I'm not reaching people. That doesn't mean that people aren't lurking and seeing things. Like, and I yeah. think that's where like, the biggest thing that I've learned is like a lot of where I gained value from people. It's not necessarily where I interacted with their content or whatever. It's like, I read something and for some reason it spoke to me or it it shifted my perspective or the way that I was thinking through something. And so I think that's where like, I have to recognize that like, this isn't a, I'm not doing this for vanity metrics. I'm not doing this for, you know, the number of followers or likes or whatever, but I'm doing it for a deeper purpose. And I think that's where like, when you realize that it kind of makes everything else fade away. And honestly, when I started shifting that mindset, it also the likes came, the people that it's like, it it all kind of works itself out. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about growth mindset. So where, where does that come from for you? So growth mindset is actually a concept that I, I really hadn't spent a lot of time like diving into the world of mindsets and what they meant until um, my first tech job I I worked for. Like I said, it was a med device QMS. We actually had a mindset coach that worked with us. So a lot of what I learned through this is like the concept of like a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. So in a fixed mindset, you're the victim. Everything, things are happening to you. You're just there and all this stuff is happening to you. And in a growth mindset, every experience good and bad, you're learning from, you're being challenged, you're like, you're being shaped. You look at Olympians, you look at CEOs of Fortune 500 companies or all these different, like, like the Oprah's of the world and stuff. And you look at them and it's like, the reality is they are humans. They are people that made a lot of choices along the way that they were going to be great. And they put the work in. Somebody is not born an Olympian or an athlete or a marathon, like whatever. Or Taylor Swift. Yeah, no, like Taylor Swift puts the work in. Like she made decisions. She chose, she chose this path. And at at any point, like Taylor Swift is such a good example. It's like, she could have easily been like, all right, I've done it. I I am great. I can now coast. I can now just enjoy my life. But instead, she continues to push for her. Like she continues to do more, do better and give back to the community and the world. And like, I just feel like that's where like, for me, it was really inspiring this idea that like, 
I can be anything. I can do anything. And I, I feel like that's something that like I project to my kids of like, especially having a little girl, like having a daughter, there's something, I read something or I saw something recently where it's like, by the time that a girl is five, they start to have these like feelings that it's like, I can't be anything. I can't be a scientist or I can't be this or that or whatever. And it's like, that's where like my daughter's beyond that. She's seven now. And I want her to be like, wow, I am the most brilliant thing in the world. And maybe these are issues that I'm going to have to deal with later because I'm <laughs> building a very, very confident little girl. But you know what? I would take that any day. Like I, I want yeah. her to feel like she can do anything and be anything. Oh. And that's something that like, there's that part of me. There's that little girl inside of me that's like, don't give up, Julie. Like you've got this. You can be anything you want. Just put in the work. Oh, I love that. I love that. It's always funny how when we have daughters or kids, like I feel like it just shifts our mindset and perspective to be like, it's not just for me anymore. It's like, I don't just work for myself. I now I do this as an example for my kids and for yeah. the people around me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's why I was so excited to have a daughter because I think, you know, it's harder in some ways. It's a lot harder, but that's why I'm saying, I'm like, I know I'm going to bite myself for all of this, but at the same time, I know. I'm just like, what it <laughs> sometimes I like fast forward, like, you know, so my daughter's two. So like fast forward like 13 years and I'm just like, I'm just going to like let my husband handle. <laughs> yeah. I'm putting my time in now. I had a parent teacher conference, um, a couple months back. My daughter was in like a Montessori school before, and now she's in the elementary school in first grade. And I had her first parent teacher conference and the teacher said, like, she's leading off the conversation. She was like, I have to tell you. And she was like, your daughter is amazing. And she was like, she is so smart. She works really hard. She's kind. And she goes, and nobody is going to talk her into doing something that she doesn't want to do. And she goes, including me, which, you know, can be frustrating sometimes. But she goes, but as somebody, but she goes, but she's exactly what you would want in a daughter. Then she was like, she is confident. She knows, like, she was like, she believes in what she believes in. And she was like, as long as we can kind of keep shape, shifting this and shaping it in the right way. But it was just like, I think the coolest experience hearing like another adult, somebody that's not related to her being like, she's amazing. This girl's going to do amazing things. So I was like, yes, she is. Thank you. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me at all because I think parenting, you know, there's so much that you try to feed them the right things and you try to, you know, deal with their tantrums in the right way and all of these things. But it's, it's setting that example that makes the difference and the way that you are in the world as her mom. I mean, yeah, that doesn't surprise me one bit. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. When I was, uh, when I lost my job, I went to pick her up that day and I told her what happened because I believe in like, talking through all this, all yeah. this stuff. we talk about work, we talk about challenges and stuff, but I told her what happened and that I was feeling sad and all of that. And she comes home and runs downstairs to my husband. I just hear her being like, daddy, did you hear what happened to mom? And like, I loved that. She just like assumed that I hadn't talked to my own husband about this yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, What's your name? Everly. Everly. Oh gosh. What a sweetie. Yeah. Well, Julie, thank you. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your heart. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been such a fun conversation. And I truly appreciate kind of the conversation that we had, but also you reminded me that I do have hobbies and that I need to take time for myself. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And we'll, we'll have to figure out some virtual paint night. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah. please. Yeah.